Welcome to lecture 11 of ECE 4305 Software Defined Radio Systems and Analysis. In this lecture, we'll be studying the topic of optimal detection. As we saw in the last class, um, we, we looked at how we can convert time domain signal waveforms into a vector representation. And, and part of the uh, motivation for doing uh, that conversion to a different framework is that it sometimes yields a lot more uh, sort of mathematically accessible uh, types of derivations and analyses. Um, so instead of uh, conducting integrals over difficult, um, um, difficult time domain waveforms, instead all we need to do is uh, various vector and matrix operations instead. So we're going to leverage that signal vector framework extensively uh, in this lecture, um, in particular when deriving the optimal detection scheme at the receiver. So why do we need optimal detection? Well, uh, recall the simple digital transceiver model we saw several lectures ago, where we transmitted over the air um, uh, some signal, S of T, um, or it could be down a copper wire or a op fiber optic cable. And then that, that signal gets corrupted by uh, some unwanted signal, noise. And the noise is actually an accumulation of a lot of unwanted signals, but we, we represent all those unwanted signals in one single waveform uh, for the sake of um, uh, making life a little bit simpler when deriving the uh, optimal detector. So the receiver is going to intercept um, a corrupted uh, transmitted signal, so S of T plus N of T, and it's up to it to decide uh, which symbol was transmitted. Um, and so that noise will try and obfuscate. It's going to uh, sort of disrupt our uh, 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 decision-making process. And so we need to devise a way of doing the best job possible in terms of figuring out what was transmitted under these circumstances. Okay, so let's draw our simple digital transceiver model. So suppose that we have at this end, we have our transmitting device. And at this end, we have our receiving device, OK? Great. Now, uh, normally, if let's say under ideal conditions, we would have the signal come out of the transmitting device, and then it would be received with no problem whatsoever by the receiving device. Uh, but unfortunately, in the real world, we have something in between that can influence negatively that transmission. And that guy is noise. That's our noise. And in fact, this is our additive noise channel. So even if we transmit SI of T over the channel, um, the noise is going to corrupt it. It's going to be added to it. So it makes it that much more difficult for the receiver to know what, which, which S uh, which symbol has been transmitted. And so we re represent this corrupted transmission as R of T. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to convert our time domain signal waveforms into vector representations. And we saw a little bit of this in last class, where what we, what we did is we try and come up with a, a set of orthonormal basis functions that can uh, be used in order to represent uh, each waveform by a weighted sum of these basis functions. So suppose we want to take S i of t, our transmitted signal waveform, uh, the noise uh, uh, waveform n of t, and the received signal waveform r of t, and we want to decompose them uh, into these orthonormal basis functions. Um, what we would essentially do is we would have these three summations as we see at the top of this slide here. And we now need to figure out what is S, I, F, K, R, K, and N, K. These are the weights that uh, are multiplied uh, against the corresponding orthonormal basis function that we all sum together in order to create that um, time domain representation. Um, and those weights actually form the coordinates of, uh, of points in the vector space that, will, that are defined by the orthonormal basis function. So once we've converted our waveforms into these vectors, um, we, we're ready. We're ready. Uh, a good way of uh, a good way through the derivation of trying to determine what is the optimal detector that should be used at the receiver. Uh, 
So instead of playing with some, uh, you know, these time domain waveforms, which might involve integration and other sort of complicated mathematical operations that might be time consuming, instead we have this beautiful vector model below where the vector r, which is the uh, vector representation of the intercepted signal r of t, is equal to the sum of the uh, transmitted uh, signal si, okay, and that's the vector representation of si of t, plus the noise vector n, uh, n which is a vector representation of n of t. So, um, given this conversion uh, from the time domain, uh, sort of time domain signal waveform into a vector representation, the first question we might want to ask is, what is the distribution of n? So again, it always comes back down to whenever we convert a random variable into some other domain, the first thing we want to know is how does the characterization, the quantitative characterization of that random variable change um, in, in, in the new framework? So we go from n of t, which we know is Gaussian, okay? We make that assumption. It's a AWGN channel, as we, as we saw before. How, what, what, what is the distribution of the elements that form the vector n? What are they equal to? Well, it turns out that um, given that we can represent each one of those vector elements of n, the vector n, as this integral here, equa equation one, um, which is essentially we are um, um, taking the dot product of the uh, of n of t against one of the basis functions, uh, uh, phi k of t, to yield n of k, it turns out that what happens when you take a Gaussian random variable, in this case n of t, multiply by a deterministic uh, waveform, in this case phi k of t, and integrate uh, over a period 0 to t, it turns out that because integration is a linear operation, it turns out that when we perform this linear operation on a Gaussian random variable, even if it's multiplied by a deterministic waveform, the output will also be Gaussian. But its parameters, its characteristics, its mean, its variance might have changed. So we need to drive that. So first of all, we know based on this equation one that n of k will be Gaussian. But we need to know now what are the st statistics of n of k. So first things first, let's find the mean. So we take the expectation of n of k, um, or mean of n of k, and that's equal to uh, essentially taking the expectation of that equation one from the previous slide. And what happens is the expectation is also a linear operator. So we can interchange the integral and the expectation operator like we've done on the second line here, and zoom in on what is random, which is the n of t. Since we're dealing with, we're making the assumption that we're dealing with a zero mean AWGN channel, E n of t is equal to zero, which makes the entire expression zero. So n of k is zero, yay. Now the variance. So in order to calculate the variance, we use the, we use the following uh, expression here. So first of all, let's take um, uh, the vector n and multiply by n transpose. So that superscript t, that is the vector transpose. So if it was a column vector, it's now a row vector. If it was a row vector, it's now a column vector. And we take the KL element of that matrix because when we take this, um, the product of these two vectors, it will yield a matrix. And that matrix, um, well, each one will be consisting of a product of each one of those noise vector elements. In this case, we're very interested in looking at um, uh, noise, uh, noise vector element nk multiplied with noise vector element nl. And so now what we want to do is what is the expectation of that particular element? So we, so we use the, we, we, we rewrite those vector elements in terms of their original time domain waveforms and we combine them together like we see here at the bottom. So e n k n l is equal to e that entire integral expression for nk multiplied by that entire integral expression for nl. And again, integration is a linear operation, so we can mis mix and match, move the integral in and out and all around, uh, of course, uh, subject to dependencies. So we get this double integral uh, from 0 to t in both cases, nt, n rho, phi k t, phi l, uh, that should be rho, <laughs> and uh, dt, d rho. 
And what it turns out is that, first of all, um, when we take the expectation, again, expectation is a linear operator, we can bring the expectation from the outside of that double integral expression to the insides of it and zero in on what is random. In this case, what is random? nt and rho. So we then take the expectation of nt and rho. It turns out that because it's AWGN, it, that means the noise is only correlated with itself. Okay, at uh, at, a, at at its own time instance. So n uh, so t has to be equal to rho. Otherwise, that expectation is equal to zero. So we start simplifying like crazy. So the first thing we do is uh, we know that um, uh, we we tr take that e n t n rho and turn it into a delta function, which means that only when delta um, t minus rho, when t is equal to rho, it's going to be equal to 1 and otherwise 0. And n naught over 2, that's the power spectral density of the noise, which should be flat, right, because it's white noise. So that simplifies everything. So now we can bring down the double integral expression into a single integral expression. In this case, we replace everything with t's. Now it's kind of interesting because now we have the integral of two basis functions. And what do we know about that? They're orthonormal, which means that unless k is equal to L, that expression is equal to zero. So we have another delta function. So at the end of the day, it turns out that that big matrix, that correlation matrix that's formed by the expectation of n times n transpose is equal to a diagonal matrix where the diagonal is uh, multiplied by n naught over 2, and the uh, upper and lower triangular halves are equal to 0. So this is a phenomenal result. That means that our noise vector is 0 mean, and it has a purely diagonal correlation matrix, which is fantastic. This is going to be great when we use this later on. So, and, and there's one thing that should be noted. First of all, again, just to reiterate, for Gaussian random variables only, uncorrelatedness means independence, okay? No, no other random variable has the same property. Also, by the central limit theorem, if we sum up the outputs of several random variables possessing the same probability characteristics, they will yield a Gaussian distribution. That's a beautiful property. That's why uh, we often model the, um, uh, the channel noise as a Gaussian because it's the sum of a lot of different sources of noise and so it, we can approximate, you know, rather reasonably that this noise is going to be Gaussian. Okay, this is phenomenal because now from knowing, knowing that the noise vector, okay, n, is zero mean and has a diagonal uh, correlation matrix, uh, we can now define our uh, Gaussian random variable. But it's interesting because in probability theory, if you have uh, what they call a random vector, okay, which n is, uh, we can jointly characterize every element of that noise vector by a one-dimensional Gaussian. If they are uncorrelated, like we just saw, like the correlation matrix is a diagonal. And so what we have here is the probability density function of the vec noise vector n is going to be equal to the product of all n one-dimensional Gaussian PDFs, like we see over here. And remember I said about uncorrelatedness implies independence? Well, look what happens on the second line here. It's essentially we're taking the product of each individual one-dimensional PDF of each no noise vector element. And that only happens when we have independence in, in the situation. So this is great, because now what we get at the bottom, and this will come up uh, quite soon when deriving the optimal detector, um, is P of n, the probability of the noise vector n, is equal to 1 over 2 pi sigma squared, so that's the variance sigma squared, to the power of n over 2 e to the magnitude squared of the noise vector divided by uh, 2 sigma squared and uh, magnitude squared so the um, so that's the distance essentially that's the Euclidean distance from the origin to the uh, uh, sort of the head of the noise vector take its length squared divided by 2 sigma squared okay so now that we've got 
um, the uh, statistical side of this um, of this um, uh, situation under control. Let's now derive what the probability of correct detection is. Okay, because that's how we're going to find out our optimal rule. And so our criterion for the receiver is we want to minimize the probability of error, right? We, we don't want error as much as possible. It's, it's probably going to be unavoidable, but let's keep it to as small as possible in terms of the number of times that we do get an error situation. This is equal to saying we want to be right. We want to maximize being right at the receiver as much as possible, right? So it turns out that the probability of being correct and the probability of having an error are complementary to each other. So the probability of error is equal to 1 minus the probability of being correct, because uh, the maximum probability you can have in any situation is 1. So what we now do is let's say the probability of correct detection is equal to this um, uh, the volume integral of these conditional probabilities. So basically, it's the probability that we correctly received the message given that we've received um, uh, or intercepted a signal rho times the probability, uh, the PDF, sorry, of rho d and d rho. Okay, so what we now need to do is in order to uh, uh, maximize um, uh, the probability of correct reception, we now need to uh, maximize this conditional probability PC given rho, uh, r is equal to rho. So let's take this one step further. So let's say we want to maximize this conditional probability. Our decision rule is the following. It's essentially um, the following where uh, the probability that we got sk given rho is greater than or equal to the probability that we received si given rho. So, so we're, making, we're making an assumption here uh, that sk was sent by the transmitter. Um, the probability that we got sk given that we have observed rho at the receiver should be, should absolutely be greater than or equal to the probability that we received some other uh, or uh, uh, waveform given that we have observed only observed um, rho at the receiver. Okay, and what is rho equal to? It's equal to that embedded sk plus the noise vector. All right. So let's let's look at that uh, conditional probability a little bit more. Let's let's look at um, the probability of receiving an si given uh, r equals rho, and we use something called Bayes rule. But it's a funny version of Bayes rule. It's called the mixed form of Bayes rule. So we have the PDF little p of rho given si times the probability of SI happening divided by the PDF of rho. That's what we see in equation six. So with this mixed form of Bayes rule, um, and recalling that we want to maximize the probability of correct reception given that we've observed rho at the receiver, our optimal detector, folks, is going to be equal to, we need to find the SI that maximizes this conditional probability, that the probability that we received SI, um, given that we've observed rho at the receiver, so, for, uh, so we look at every SI and we say, what's the probability that we received this SI given this observation? And we do it for all SI, okay, I is equal to 1 through M. And the, the probability, the, 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 the SI that gives us the largest probability is um, hopefully the one that we transmitted at the transmitter, okay? And so if we plug in mixed Bayes rule into that, as we see in equation seven, we get this um, interesting looking formula, but, but look at it more carefully. Does, does uh, the probability density function uh, or PDF or P of rho at the denominator, does that have SI in it? Nope, um, it's, a, it, it's what we have observed, right? So it's not influenced at all. So we can remove that. That doesn't affect our maximization operation whatsoever. So now we have, as we see in equation eight, this new optimal detection rule. So um, last but not least, so from this um, optimal detector, we, can, we, we, can, we, can, we have one of two possible approaches. We have something called maximum a posteriori or MAP detectors, where um, the probability of receiving SI given that we've observed rho at the receiver is equal to max SI, 
um, the PDF of rho given SI times the probability of SI occurring, and then the maximum likelihood detector, or ML detector, is almost the same except that we assume that all SIs are equally likely. So what we're going to see is that in the next class, um, we're going to see how, if let's say the noise is Gaussian, this is going to affect, uh, or this will actually give us a closed form solution for what the um, uh, optimal detector should look like at the receiver.